Ladies and gentlemen, I present Sonic Reality. Don't tap your foot. So that was Nigel Stanford, if you want to look him up on the net. He's got all these clips like that. Now they were real experiments. Now I thought, you know, we've seen all those videos where someone vibrates the plate of sand and you know, you look at the different patterns. But you know, this just summed up all the different experiments that you can do. And in the foyer at, uh, after this session, we do have a water resonance uh, set up there that you can have a look at. Now Nigel, he's in 440 Hertz. In this session you're going to be learning about 440 hertz and 432 hertz and what the difference is. 440 hertz I call angry tones. Now there is a reason for that and it comes down to the geometry. So we're going to, going to explore this why. You know, I'll, I'm just talking to people before. I want to see the empirical evidence of why things are why they are. There's, there's always an explanation. And you know, quantum mechanics and physics is now explaining the supernatural of what we deemed that's just spiritual stuff. Now quantum mechanics is actually explaining these things. So it's fascinating. But at the end of the day, when we strip things right back to the molecular level, right down to the atomic level, there's a sound and a vibration happening. So let's look a bit deeper into that. So this is a very interesting statement and I don't know the author, but it's always stuck to me. When we start presenting this deep information of what's going on at a vibrational level, scientists are not really interested in this stuff because it didn't fit into our schooling model or our paradigm. And then spiritualists aren't really interested in the empirical evidence when you start explaining why they experience what they do at a spiritual level. It's just amazing, isn't it? So that's a thought that I want you to hold on to. So Billy Carson he explains our realities very at a very interesting level. We're in the third dimension. What we tend to not understand is that time really doesn't exist. Clocks exist. Big time mainstream quantum physicists and theoretical physicists are admitting that this is true now. We've been given this functional arrow of time, which puts us in one specific direction so that we can organize our thoughts and our days and our years and weeks and what we're gonna do and what we're gonna meet up with somebody and everything else. So we have this ability to coordinate and collaborate with each other. However, if you understand that time is also an illusion, it's something that you can use as a tool, but if you also understand that it's an illusion, then you can actually master time and you can maximize what you're doing on this planet. Because if you go in all the higher dimensions, you know, we're in the third. So if you draw a line on a piece of paper, that's the first dimension. If you then connect those lines and, and uh, create a house on a piece of paper, that's a two-dimensional structure, or you can move it into a computer, 
anything you see in a computer that looks 3D is actually 2D. And because we're in the third, we can see down into 2D, we can see all the way down obviously into 1D, and we can manipulate those dimensions from our higher selves. The fourth dimension is something called a tesseract. If you go into the ancient text, it's Metatron's cube. Meta, M-E-T-A, metaverse, right? They got that from Metatron's cube. Now this fourth dimension is really something called a quasi-crystal. And this quasi-crystal in the fourth dimension, it casts a shadow, and the shadow that it casts, it creates the realm that we're living in here. We're living in a shadow of a higher dimension. That shadow creates a third dimension. It actually creates a fractal of it, creates this fractal holographic matrix that we're actually maneuvering in in the third dimension right now. You can address a fourth dimension of time like Albert Einstein was saying if you're just looking at a third plus a fourth being the arrow. But when you actually move up into another dimension, we now know in quantum physics that there is actually a fourth dimension. So all dimensions are in 90 degree angles of each other. And according to uh, quantum theory right now, we're really anticipating that there's at least 11 dimensions or otherwise the universe would collapse. So there really is truly a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way up, not just the arrow of time. That's just something extra. So there's some references to interstellar there. So if we look down at the molecular level of the human body, this is kind of what we see. It doesn't look exactly like this, but there's an electron cloud and it is moving at 9 billion cycles a second. Now this is uh, when someone tells me that digital sounds better than analog. Well, we are analog beings of resonance. And then when you're hearing music, you're not just hearing it at a physical level. You're hearing it at an electrical molecular level right down to your core in the other dimension, these fourth dimensions and higher. Nine billion resolution. You know, the top studios are recording at 192,000 cycles a second. And that's impressive, you know, for studios. It takes a lot of computer power to do that. But us human beings, we're referencing sound and experiences at 9 billion cycles a second. So, analog beings of resonance, AI can never, ever, ever compete with the human complex. Never, never. It can try, but it will never compete. Now let's talk about the D-Wave. Who's heard of the D-Wave quantum computing? They're pulling information. Now this is the words of the guys that built it from another dimension. That's where they're pulling the data from the quantum computer. Oh, they've just tapped into this quantum mechanics and they're processing this power at a parallel dimension. That's just how it is. Now this next clip was inspired by my son, Joshi. And there's, there's this clip he loves watching and it shows the planets. It starts from the Earth and then it goes to, oh, it's, I think the Moon, the Earth, and it goes through all the planets from smallest to largest, all through the galaxies to the biggest thing, the universe. So this clip, we go the other way.
So when we strip the body down to the smallest elements, we are just a vi it's a vibrational state of energy. The atomic bonds and structures. I love looking at uh, scientists explain how do atoms bond? What what are the molecular bonds? What is that? And they come up with some very funny funny answers. But there's there's an energy force that's holding these bonds together. That's the reality. Uh, you know you can pass you can pass matter through it. Is matter an, an illusion? Well, yes, matter is an illusion because down to the molecular structure, it's just a vibrational energy source. No, the the electron cloud around an atom. Why is it a cloud? Well, it's a cloud because the electrons are moving at nine billion cycles a second all around. So there's an energy cloud, and we're going to talk about tapping into that energy, and that energy has been tapped into, big time. So for us to comprehend these things, why we are electrical beings of resonance, we need to look at the water. We are 70% water, and water has a memory. Water is a crystalline structure in one form or another. Our body is a crystalline structure. The earth is a crystalline structure. So it has, water has a memory. It has an electromagnetic memory. So let's look at that. So here's an experiment where we have a vessel of water and we're putting an electromagnetic charge through the water at 528 hertz, just for fun. Now there's a reason why we use 528 hertz and 432. So we charge the water with 30 minutes with a charge and we radiate it. Now that's transmuting an electrical magnetic signal to a analog audio signal to show that that's the signal that we're using. And we label that 528 hertz, that charged water, and we put it aside. Charge it up for only 30 minutes, and then we leave it for two whole days. And then after two days, let's put an analyzer in the water and see what we pick up. <clears throat> well, what do you know? It's emitting the same frequency we charged it with two days ago. And sometimes the words of what someone speak to us are still in our mind a few days, sometimes years, is that right? because water has a memory. All right, let's look a bit deeper into this water structure. Masuru Emoto from his book, The Message from Water. Mr. Emoto's work provides factual evidence that human vibrational energy, thoughts, words, ideas, and music affect the molecular structure of water. This photo shows the beautifully formed geometric design of the Yushi Spring water. This next photo is from the Shimanto River, the last clean spring in Japan. Notice the extraordinary geometric forms. The fact that the molecular structure of water can be affected by our consciousness, our intent, and our sounds is extremely important. Mr. Moto has been visually documenting these molecular changes in water by means of his photographic techniques. He freezes droplets of water, then examines them under a dark field microscope that has photographic capabilities. His work clearly demonstrates the diversity of the molecular structure of water and the effects of the environment upon the structure of the water. This photo is from contaminated water from the Yodo River in Japan. In this photo we can compare the contaminated water with clean stream water. Look at the difference. This photo is the effect of box air for the g-string on the water. This photo is water exposed to Chopin's farewell song. 
This photo shows the effect of heavy metal music upon the water. Here now we can compare the effects of healing versus heavy metal music and what happens to the water molecules. This Kuramoto decided to see how thoughts and words affected the formation of untreated distilled water crystals by typing words onto paper and then taping this paper onto glass bottles overnight. This photo shows the effects of the words, thank you. This next photo shows the effects of the words, love and appreciation. This photo shows the effects of the words, you make me sick, I will kill you. And here we can compare the effects of thank you with the you make me sick, I will kill you. Very, very different geometric forms being incurred through the intention. And in this photo we can compare the toxic water and then the effects of praying over the water. So snowflakes, snowflakes look beautiful too, don't they? What's a snowflake? just another form of water molecule isn't it and it is gorgeous so I, I found this out in the early 2000s and I was like wow this is phenomenal let's do our own test and we've got three cups of rice with the same amount of rice same amount of water no one's touched anything and we're going to put glad wrap over to seal it and then the kids spoke to it the kids did this one Having a closer look into these ones, this is the I hate you one. It stinks beyond imagination, it's just feral. So there you go, that, that sealed the deal for me. And I hear some parents how they speak to their children, like full on swearing at them. I think, oh my gosh, if you only knew what you're doing down to the cellular level to your child, it's phenomenal. So let's have a look at a water sound image. This is during intention, a meditation. Intention, intention, intention. Intention, intention, intention. Intention, intention, intention. And again, intention, this is intention, before meditation. Intention, intention. Next one is during the middle. Intention. Intention. When she's in a very, you know, deep, intention, stressful state. Intention, that's after intention. meditation. Look at that water image. Now we look a bit deeper into water imaging and the, a specific invention that measures these beautifully. So let's look at the bioelectric field. Okay, so these two guys are my favorite pioneers. Semyon Kurlian and Valentina Kurlian, who developed the Kurlian photography. And they had a, an electrical pad and you place things on the pad and you can take a photograph and it captures the electrical bio signature around that living element and it's phenomenal what they capture on there and Dr. Valerie Hunt she mapped out the bio EMF signals coming from the body she worked out a way to map the aura fields what is that? It's the electrical EMF signal and Dr. Valerie Hunt found out a way to map out that system. Now at the University of California at Los Angeles, a laboratory exists where researchers are attempting to capture this human energy on film. The process is called Curlian photography, named after Seymour and Valentina Curlian, Russian scientists who pioneered it in the 1930s. Place your finger on the top row of the film. The subject places her fingertips on a sheet of photographic paper, which lies on top of an electrically charged plate. The paper is exposed and developed like an ordinary black and white photograph. The results, however, are not at all ordinary. 
These curly in motion pictures revealed that an energy field, or corona, exists around each fingertip as it does around different parts of the body. This corona, rather than remaining constant, varies with changes in the subject's state of mind. In one experiment, the subject, calm at the start, is pricked with an unpleasantly sharp object. The corona of her thumb, at first brilliant and wide, becomes increasingly smaller and less distinct under stress until, with the subject at our most anxious, it almost disappears. In a reverse experiment, a tense subject is invited to have a drink and relax, under strictly controlled conditions, of course. At the outset, the subject <laughs> is anxious. His corona I'm not is promoting thin. drunkenness, all right? After nine ounces of alcohol, it becomes broader. It's just tipsy. <laughs> After 14 ounces, it displays what you might almost call a rosy glow. Yes, well, I'm, yeah. In an experiment done with <laughs> cancer like and healthy rats, the results indicate a definite difference in the corona around their tails. The implications of this research are promising. If these tests are substantiated, perhaps one day curly and photography will be used as a tool in medical diagnosis. Every living thing radiates an energy all its own. Yet to what do these energy fields correspond? Curlian photographs of plant leaves and flower petals have raised some curious and as yet unanswered questions. Normally, healthy plants have distinctive colorful coronas. On a few occasions when part of a leaf has been cut off, a strange ghost after image appears. Researchers call it the phantom leaf effect, but no one knows yet what it means. What happens when two human energy fields come in contact? Tim and Lois are lovers. Photographed alone, his finger's aura is blue and spiky. Hers is white and softer around the edges. When they touch, their coronas mix and mingle. In contrast, observe this curly in photograph of people who are a little angry at each other. And this one, in which the person on the left is extremely hostile. Research has shown that the auras of the strong tend to dominate the weak, as can be seen in this curly in family portrait. Mother and father at the top, child at the bottom, rather overwhelmed. Now, many of us have been in situations where you walk into a room and some people have been fighting or they've been talking negatively about you and you walk in the room and it's like you feel something don't you there's you know an emf electrical field now what's going on when someone walks into the room and you you're sensing or some negative words have been spoken to bet from you depending on how powerful your aura is or how sensitive you've trained your field you know exactly what's going on because words and intention carry power so it's the intention that changes that field so this comes down to a toroidal field pattern that comes emanates off you and it, it's wavy it changes now spirituality will call this your spirit okay because we are electrical beings of resonance but the electrical component phases fr at, from the other dimensions as Billy Carson was, was explaining which quantum mechanics is now now explaining very clearly. Your toroidal field can sense very clearly the state of someone's intention towards you. You can feel it, and you can actually feel it from the other side of the world. And this was the beauty before telephones. Letters were written. You know, someone in the war, they'll write a letter, and they'll send it to a loved one, and as they're reading, they're feeling the emotion of the letter. They're feeling the intent. You know, and you can just say one word to someone if you feel, and, and you know, sometimes you'll have a friend and they just call you, oh, you're just on my heart, you know, how's everything going? Oh, actually, everything's really terrible, you know, so what did they feel? So let's look a bit deeper. What did they feel? Did you know that the human heart is the organ that generates the strongest electromagnetic field of any organ of the human body? It produces an electromagnetic field 5,000 times as powerful as that produced by your brain. Furthermore, this energy field changes in relation to your emotions. One thing you should know about electromagnetic field is that every organ and cell in your body generate an energy field. 
Since the heart generates the strongest electromagnetic field, the information stored in its electromagnetic field affects every organ and cell in your body. Could this be why the heart is the first organ developed in a baby inside their mother's womb? The heart beats before the brain is even developed. Mathematicians call this pattern the torus. The energy in a torus flows in through one end, circulates around the center, and exits out the other side. It's balanced, self-regulating, and always whole. The torus is like the breath of the universe. It's the form that the flow of energy takes at every scale of existence. But there's also an underlying structure in how the flow fits together, sort of like a skeleton. It's called the vector equilibrium. A term coined by one of the 20th century's greatest thinkers, Buckminster Fuller. Hello. Today we're going to talk about the torus, a fundamental pattern in all of reality. I have a friend here with me as well who's going to help share this with you. His name is Christopher Luff. Hi, I'm Chris, also known as Yana. Today, I will be helping my angelic friend Patch to expound the wisdom of love and spirituality in relation to the toroid. Let's get down to it. The torus is a very fundamental part of nature. So fundamental, in fact, that science is now seeing that everything moves through this form in one way or another, including ourselves. Very simply, the torus is a self-organizing system that all comes together at a space of unity and expands its energy out all around itself until it returns back to that original space in the center, and will continue to do it again. In quantum physics, mathematics, and generally all forms of science, this geometry really begins to bridge the gap between understanding how sacred geometry truly is the geometry of life. This is a geometry that breathes. It has life itself. Our very own hearts are the first and best examples of a toroid. The heart is where it all starts. The energy of our hearts flow outward in a toroidal fashion and are also received in a toroidal fashion. This way, everything we send out in love, we are immediately affected by as a result. In other words, our emanation of love is a gift to yourself as much as it's a gift to the universe around you. You can look in nature to see these shapes everywhere. It's in oranges and apples. You can see it around tornadoes. The magnetic field of the earth is a very powerful example. The Institute of Heart Math, as well as Stanford University, among others, have now scientifically demonstrated that around the physical heart of your body you have two toroidal fields, one inside the other, which are connected to the sacred space and the tiny space within the heart. So Dr. Valerie Hunt measured the mapping of the human aura, or this EMF field that emanates from every living being. And it doesn't just come from humans, it comes from animals as well. So here's a quote, and now this is leading us into scalar waves, because there's no scalar waves without EMF waves. It's like a byproduct of EMF waves. And this is just a, an excerpt from an interview, and I didn't commit this to memory because it's quite a bit. So this is one of the few things that I will read out. And this is a quote that you can look online to check the whole interview. It's fascinating. Recently, we've discovered another form of electromagnetism that is organized into a different pattern. It is no longer a wave, but is changed to a standing or stationary energy. In physics, this is called a scalar wave. When it exists inside the body, I call it the bioscalar wave. This scalar energy does not flow like waves, but it does occupy space and increases in spatial mass. When the space it occupies is sufficient, the energy expands outward and circles of energy. This energy expanding in circles directly influences the body's fluid systems, blood and lymphatic system. So this is leading us into some functions of what the DNA does, how the DNA communicates between our body and other parallel dimensions. Very few people know that in the universe there exists unlimited high frequency energy and our human body has the ability to resonate with this energy. This is not well understood by modern science either. In this video, we will introduce several astonishing experiments to explain this phenomenon. One's thoughts affect DNA. The first experiment we will discuss was carried out by Mr. Cleve Baxter. The subject of the experiment was placed in room A, and the subject's DNA sample was collected and isolated in room B. Mr. Baxter then monitored the subject's mood changes as well as the electrical reactions of his DNA sample in the other room. When the subject in room A was emotionally stimulated, his DNA in room B concurrently responded. 
Feeling inspired, Mr. Baxter wanted to find whether this connection between the DNA and its owner would be affected by distance. To verify this idea, the subject and his DNA were separated by 560 kilometers. Mr. Baxter then conducted the same experiment and the subject's DNA reacted similarly and simultaneously. How could this be? The DNA and its owner were separated hundreds of miles away. So how is the DNA able to know its owner's emotional changes? This experiment suggests that human beings' emotional fluctuations are reflected on their DNA instantly. The following experiment was carried out by Dr. Glenn Rain. This experiment proves humans' thoughts are able to affect the shape of one's DNA. Usually when a human cell divides or is damaged, DNA will unwind. When DNA repairs, it winds. In this experiment, DNA was separated into two groups, a test group and a control group. Then Dr. Rain asked a group of subjects to wind or unwind the test group's DNA simply using their thoughts. As a result, the test group's DNA began to wind or unwind at a rate between 2% and 10%. Compared with the control group of DNA towards which the subjects did not direct their thoughts and it showed only a 1.1% rate of change. Dr. Rain's experiment also indicated that anger winds DNA more heavily or more tightly. We've just seen how two scientists, Cleve Baxter and Glenn Rain, used two different approaches to prove that human thought does affect DNA. But the secret around DNA could be far deeper than we have seen. Dr. Peter B. Garyev's experiment proved DNA is able to store photons. He put DNA samples inside a quartz container. He illuminated the DNA with a weak laser. As a result, the DNA acted like a miniature black hole and absorbed all the photons. We normally don't consider photons as something that can be stored because photons in the form of light usually pass through space at a very high speed. But this experiment proved that photons are just like food and can be stored inside DNA. It's similar to how squirrels store nuts inside a hollow section of a tree trunk for winter. This experiment suggests that DNA contains an invisible energy field that has not been discovered yet. Though it's not the electromagnetic field we normally recognize, yet it's able to control electromagnetic energy by storing photons, for example. Dr. Gary compared DNA to an intelligent biological computer, which is able to store and search all of a person's cell's biological information inside the human body. All the DNA within a human body acts like a biological internet, so to speak, which enables tens of trillions of cells with, to communicate with each other via electromagnetic signals. For a long period of time, mainstream science believed only 2% of DNA encodes protein sequences, which is called coding DNA and the remaining 98% of DNA is called junk DNA because there seemed to be no biological function there. But according to experiment, there are deeper secrets to discover about human DNA. So here's some DNA bombshells from Billy Carson. So one thing I want to talk about is the fact that DNA is a storage medium. In other words, it's a hard drive. You're a walking hard drive, your body. One gram of DNA, this is science, peer-reviewed science by the way guys, one gram of DNA, which is enough to put a little tiny drop on the tip of your finger, can store 700 terabytes of data. So these scientists, uh, the main one, George Church and Cree Shuri, those two actually together, are partners and scientists, they discovered this and they downloaded one of their books, one of their e-books onto the DNA, and then they uploaded it from the DNA back to the server again. They was like, whoa, wait a minute. They then took that same ebook, downloaded it back to the DNA again, and they said, let's see how much we can go. They replicated the book 70 billion times in one gram of DNA. Because just like I told you about you know, DNA being able to be a hard drive, which by the way, now Microsoft has created the first DNA hard drive <laughs> that really works. But let's take it to the next step now. Now they have discovered that epigenic memories can be passed down 14 generations inside of DNA. Memories. But anyway, scientists have also found out now that DNA sends and receives wireless signals, wireless information. We have a built-in Wi-Fi system in our bodies already. So, and it's this broadcast between eight to 10 feet away from the human body. So at all times of day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're all downloading information directly from the ether of space-time itself. 
But in quantum entanglement, which is something in real physics, uh, it's where you use something called parabolic down conversion to get two photons or two particles on the same frequency. So once you get two particles on the same frequency, you can take one particle to the other end of the universe if you had the capability of getting it there. And the particle that's local to you, you can change the information in it, put data on it, and the other particle will change instantaneously, bypassing the speed of light. And scientists now have discovered that the brain, the neurons in the brain, phase in and out of the third dimensional reality. So your neurons, your, between your synapses, are actually phasing in and out of the third dimension. Where are they going? They're communicating with other realms and other dimensions, syncing and, and, and quantum entangling with, with um, particles and, and thoughts in other places. So when you understand this, now you go, oh, wow. First, when you're vibrating on a high frequency, what does that mean, vibrating on a high frequency? That means you're thinking with love, not thinking with hate. You're thinking with power and love, not fear and weakness. And when you do that, that puts your DNA scientifically at a high frequency. This has been done in laboratories. They've taken DNA, they've, uh, they've analyzed a the person's thought patterns through caps that they put on with electrodes, and they've got them looking at photos. Photos that show people getting murdered, then a photo of a field of flowers, then a photo of somebody hugging a child, and then a photo of somebody getting beat up. And they analyze those thought patterns in a laboratory, and this is how they learn this. So at specific times when you're feeling the, method, the mode of fear, the DNA there's a frequency that oscillates over your DNA. It covers a very wide a band, and it, co it covers less of your DNA. In a high-frequency love mode, the frequency is oscillates much faster, and they're hence much closer together, and more of the frequency is touching your DNA strand, which means you're operating at a high frequency. This is real science. Now I'm talking about real, peer-reviewed quantum physics and quantum mechanics. I love how he backs his argument up with real science, real peer-reviewed papers. He's not just making this stuff up. You know, there's, there's one thing Billy and I will disagree with. If you keep listening to these guys, you, you, you need to take the, the chunks, the positive chunks of info that they get. We all hear and see in part. You know, not, every, not one man has all the answers. And, you know, don't take whatever I say. Look into things yourself. If you feel it resonates with you, you can look deeper into it. But uh, if you look deeper, you know, Billy Carson believes we come from the Anunnaki. That, uh, you know, we were seated. I don't believe that. Because if you look at our DNA, you know, we're 144,000 strand DNA. You know, this is the, the Adam, the seed of man. This is reality. And if you look at it, is the Anunnaki of that, what's their DNA? They got DNA. So that means... Who created them <laughs> you know there there is a source and and ev every religion and new ages they believe there is a source and this is what we're tapping into with this scalar energy where is the information our dna is getting to make you 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 know that they know via electromagnetic frequencies our dna and our cells communicate you know you see a, a microscopic live action of dna replicating you know, what's telling that to do that? There's nothing connected to it. So there's a wireless communication network, and this is where we get into the scalar waves. Now looking in, in that last drop of DNA, here's a nugget. Your DNA is a right-handed double helix made up of these four things right here. And the helix is held together by sulfuric bonds that appear after every 10 pairs of nucleotides every five pairs of nucleotides, every six pairs of nucleotides, and again, every five pairs of nucleotides. 10565, 10, or in the Hebrew Aleph Bet, Yod He Vav He, the signature of your creator, the signature of an artist under his painting, if you will. You know, people ask me, oh, where do you get all this knowledge from? You know, what's your secret? Well, you know, someone created me and, you know, I've just sort of tapped into that code. And there's a little nugget there and that's as far as I'll go with that. <laughs> All right, let's look at scalar waves just in the last, last bit, a little bit deeper before we move in on to some exciting stuff that'll wake the kids up again. So scalar waves to me are the most exciting frontier. The, the potential is phenomenal. So it's hard to describe what a scalar wave is. So if you look at Blue Shield, 
the Tesla Blue Shield technology. These guys are selling these devices that give off a, a scalar wave, right? They have a fantastic explanation on their website and I'm going to read out their, their explanation of what a scalar energy or a scalar field or wave is. Scalar energy is considered by the relatively few who know it exists as potentially the greatest discovery in the history of science. Mostly re referred to the term scalar fields or scalar energy. Other terms used to, to describe this property of the universe are information fields, longitudinal waves, zero point energy, tachyon, orgone, radiant energy, gravitic waves, quintessence, standing waves, Tesla fields, and some call it the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. The subject of scalar ties intimately into quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. The longitudinal scalar component of the electromagnetic wave does not exist normally in 3D space. Now here's where we start to get a little bit esoteric. It moves along the axis of time itself, the fourth dimension. This sounds mysterious and may be hard to understand without delving deeply into quantum mechanics, but time is considered to be simply compressed energy, compressed by the factor of the speed of light squared which happens to be a number we're looking at soon. Scalar waves are superliminal, which means they move faster than the speed of light because they are unbounded by the limitations of 3D space. Also, since they don't exist in the third dimension in the same way that matter does, they move through the empty space between all matter. They are not limited or blocked by physical obstructions in space like transverse electromagnetic waves are. So this is a scalar wave which transcends time and it's just like boom, instant. Now Billy Carson said in quantum mechanics, if you have one particle that resonates at one frequency, you can go anywhere in the universe and they will sink. Time is not the factor. Now, Tesla. Nikola Tesla is one of my heroes and he's one of the early pioneers to harness this scalar energy or this zero point energy. So here's an article which was in the public domain, August 28, 1921, from the Arizona Republican. And it's Tesla's 1921 Pierce Arrow. And it ran from his zero point energy that drew power from the scalar, via a scalar wave, and captured it. And the thing ran on nothing. <laughs> he just did it. Now this was based off a pattern, US pattern 685. 957 apparatus for the utilization of radiant energy so he called this energy the radiant energy and that was patented in november the 5th 1901 so what happened <laughs> there was no money in it so let's just push that aside so the impact of scalar waves why i'm so excited because i'm seeing the physical impact of it and it's a new frontier for me to look deeper into so in the promos you might have seen I was holding lemons up I said what is the mysterious wave that we're putting these lemons to one of them looks terrible one of them looks much better so it's now approaching two months on these lemons that I've done and I've got them here and I dare any of you to eat one of them <laughs> So you can have a good look at this and you'll, you'll definitely see the difference. And I've got two tomatoes as well, actually. And there is some peer reviewed papers which show why uh, they look good. So there's some other experience with flowers exposed to a scalar wave. And then they compared the growth of the same flowers in a control group. And consistently the ones in the scalar wave grew much better, much healthier. So, how do I get scalar waves? How I build it? Now, some of you are already onto this stuff, but I'll cover it. We build our own scalar wave generators. I build my own. I experiment with them quite deeply. But these are passive scalar wave devices that you can build. And you see that box in front of the stage? When you walked into this auditorium, you walked into a scalar field. You walked into a nice, peaceful energy field. Now that there is a, an active scalar wave generator, the Tesla Cube, and it also it 
uses the scalar wave to carry beautiful frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum that our body will latch onto. Now we have that running in our house full time and sometimes we accidentally unplug it and it takes me a couple of days, I'm like, well, something's going on, I just feel amped up, you know, ah, there, that bloody thing was unplugged, you know, and it's happened a few times now, and what happens is your body's tuning into the negative electromagnetic energy that, that we are bombarded with, we are absolutely hammered with, scalar waves will get your body off that, so that's an active, and then behind it is a passive scalar device, so these are different types, and I've brought different types and you can see that. Now, the, the physical impacts, obviously you see with the fruit, with the flowers. If you um, sleep in a scalar field, you will go into deep, deep delta sleeps. You'll have the most amazing um, vivid dreams because when you go into a delta sleep state, this physical body is out of the way, right? And then the, the parallel you as above, so below, can then start to be free and explore those dimensions. That's in reality what's going on and that's why you have such a deep sleep. So we get quite esoteric there, a little bit esoteric, but this is the physical effects of what's going on. Now there is a, a guy, if you can't be bothered making your own passive devices, um, I am in touch with S from SNA's Organite Creations and here's a YouTube channel that you can look at. He is building the most powerful um, Ormosite and Organites uh, and you can just purchase it, save you building it. And he shows the effects, so there's this Meissner effect is one of them and he's got a, a frozen water, it shows the water, what a Meissner effect does is um, levitates, you might have seen an experiment, you have a magnet and then you, you do dried ice and then put another a superconducting metal and just it levitates above and he's got this water it's going up <laughs> it's frozen and this drop of water is like a streak of water going up all right so credit to s from sna's organite creations you can check out his youtube channel that's his youtube channel there Now some of this stuff, man, looks real new agey and spun out, but the reality is if you have a lighter, where's that spark coming from? If it's not a flint, where's that spark coming from? What happens if you compress a crystal or you strike a crystal, it gives off a piezoelectric effect. So this is a nice chunky uh, crystal that I'll be doing an experiment with. But when you compress that, and when you put it in these organite molds, the resin shrinks and it compresses it and gives a piezoelectric effect. You know, your airbag that is triggered is from a crystal. It gets compressed in that moment of impact and it gives off a little spark and triggers that airbag to go off. You know, watches, this is in electronics all over the place. So it's a piezoelectric effect. That's why we can build passive devices and then when you mix these with superconducting metals, such as the ones in the platinum group, you can build some very, very powerful passive homicide devices. We can't go too deep into these areas because of time. So we're just going to be covering sonic geometry and then our grand finale on project 432. So when we look at the water, we need to look at John Stuart Reed's cymoscope. John Stuart Reed of Keswick, England, is the co-inventor of a new instrument called the cymoscope. It converts sound into three-dimensional geometric images in water. What's happening is the sound is actually compressing water molecules under the surface and actually creating a kind of lensing effect to allow light to bounce off those subsurface structures. So here you see that there's a, a pattern forming in the center if I put my finger in, you can see what happens, that it actually disturbs the pattern completely. The pattern's now gone, it's in, gone into chaos. If I take my finger out again and leave it for a second or two to restabilize, you can see that the pattern starts to come back again. So that's really interesting, isn't it? 
Here we have the beautiful song of a humpback whale. Some of this geometry that we're seeing is just exquisitely beautiful. The geometry is phenomenal. So the geometry is from the mathematics, and here's a church. So this chapel has cymatics encoded into it, like drawn um, on these cubes across the ceiling in a certain part of the chapel. And so what happened? Well, this, this guy, uh, what was his name? Stuart Mitchell. His dad basically took him in, and, they, and his dad told him there's a mystery here. And it took them, I think it was 23 years to crack it. And what they found out is it was cymatic patterns. Okay, we've all seen the cymatics and we've also, you know, it's very linked to, you know, the uh, Dr. Emoto stuff, but cymatics are certain frequencies. So what did they do? They wrote the frequencies down and guess what? They were, they were notes, you know, frequencies are notes. It's a song, it's a tune, it's a harmonic. So the question is, do all cathedrals have this? Do they all have their own tone, their own sound? So these guys who built these churches were onto something. So here's a thought that I want you to hold on to. If you only knew the magnificence of 369, then you would have the key to the universe, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla saw these numbers everywhere. And there's a reason that the sounds that you hear, the symmetry in the water is all to do with the mathematics and the geometry. Why things look like they do it specifically comes down to that. 
So here's the Kladni plate and we compare 432 hertz to 440. These are the same notes, but you can see the 440. It's quite just off. And then here's the different tones and comparisons. Not quite the same and it, it comes down, you're resonating it in frequencies that are not in balance with nature. It's as simple as that. Now a voice is much more complex than other tones and then you can see the complexity there. Let's take a moment to notice that all geometry, whether it is two or three dimensional, is also derived from base 60 mathematics that provide the foundation for a 360 degree circle, which in turn provides us with all the angles and formulas for creating virtually every shape known to humankind. If you've ever heard of Pythagorean tuning, you know that the number 432 is quite important. To Pythagoras himself, it probably wouldn't have stood out more than any other in his numerical grid. But in our quest to find a universal language based on mathematics and frequency, this particular note represents a significant piece of coincidental evidence. You see, many ancient musical instruments, from Tibetan bowls to Native American flutes, happen to produce the same tone, a tone that vibrates at 432 cycles per second. That's compelling, but even more intriguing is the fact that Pythagoras was not calculating vibration cycles to find tone 432. It just happens to be the same number. What's more, for decades, most modern musical instruments were also tuned to this same fourth octave A, with a value of 432 cycles. Roughly 1500 years ago, Mayan stargazers were the most accomplished astronomers the world had ever known. Their concept of cyclical time led to many incredible discoveries. The accurate length of a year, the exact dates of seasonal changes, even the moments when solar and lunar eclipses would occur. But their most amazing discovery was of something known as the precession of the equinox, which makes note of a very slow wobble of Earth's axis. Somehow aware of the fact that this wobble takes 25,920 years to complete, the Mayans called this cycle one great year, with each of its 12 great months requiring 2160 Earth years to complete. And what about this? Did you know that the diameter of our moon, when measured in miles, also happens to total? You guessed it, 2160. Lastly, watch what happens when we apply simple division to this highly synchronous number. 2160 divided by 2 is 1080, the angle sum of the octagon. By 3, 720, the total of the hexagon. By 4, 540, the pentagon. And by 5, are you ready? It's the key tone of 432. And by 6, 360, the number of both the square and circle. All F sharps and C sharps with our 432A thrown into the mix as if it were some kind of clue to solving a cosmic riddle. Maybe we should look at this number even more closely. As we've stated, our closest celestial neighbor, the moon, is 2160 miles across. And 216 is exactly half of 432. What about the other large object in our sky? Were you aware that our sun is 864,000 miles across? Incredibly, where the moon's base number sequence is half of 432, the sun's number sequence is exactly twice 432. And do you know how many seconds there are in a day? 86,400. Or 43,200 for the 12 hours of day, and 43,200 for the 12 hours of night. Or try this. Take the 360 degrees found in the circular shape of our sun and moon and then multiply it by the 12 hours of either day or night. The answer, 4320. Or how about this? What is the only whole number that when squared comes to within 0.01% accuracy to measuring the speed of light? 432. 432 is where it's at. Once frequencies for seven octaves were calculated, we discovered many unique properties of natural tuning. Some of them are going to be reviewed here. The sum of interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Of a square and a circle is 360 degrees. A pentagon is 540. 
A hexagon is 720. A heptagon is 900. All combined is a major chord. The same chord in the chord temperament. Combined numbers of any frequency are always nine. Three six nine. Every tone in there is divisible by three, six, or nine. It's just the nature of the natural tuning. So you can add up any tone there, it will, you'll land on 9, and this is the key to natural tuning. There's the 432 to 440 comparison on a 3D digital view, and there's the water image to conclude our water imaging side of things. So we conclude tonight on Project 432 and Project 432 was a little bit too complex for me to describe here so this is a media release that we will be sending out, Project 432. Project 432 all began when the City of Perth donated this Consagram piano to the Pro Sound Foundation. This happened when a new CEO came on board with a new vision. The piano didn't fit into the new vision, so she informed the uh, Lord Mayor's officers to donate it to her charity. Having worked with the City of Perth as the resident pianist on this very piano from 2000 to 2014, I was in regular contact with the Lord Mayor's officers concerning different audio and acoustic needs. I received a call February 2022, and while I was on the phone, I asked about the piano, how it was going, and the officer said, oh, that's quite a story, and she informed me that the CEO was wanting to get rid of it and to donate it to a charity. So as soon as she informed me that, I, I told her about uh, that I'm the chairman of the Pro Sound Foundation, which I'd commenced since I'd left the city of Perth. And we're looking for a piano to do concerts and various projects and experiments with. After a few conversations, uh, a few more phone calls, uh, it was agreed that they will donate the piano so long as we pay for the removal fees. As soon as we received the piano, we commenced a major renovation uh, work, restoring the piano back to concert uh, performance level. Uh, the piano, it had been a while since the piano had had some attention. It was sitting there all wrapped up. The beauty is in the building it was in, it's, it's a constant temperature and the staff keep it covered, keep it in very good condition. So it is in very good condition for a 1964 uh, seven foot Daneman. We engaged piano artisan Patrick Carr, who did the initial regulation, hammer resurface, and he successfully detuned the piano down to A equals 432 hertz in the equal temperament. Then we engaged Jared Finnegan for a second tuning because it, it needed to be stabilised. Um, he got it sounding really good and it was, it was very stable, but I knew there could be better. In the meantime, I discovered the work of Robert E. Grant, who discovered a Nobel piano tuning called the Precise Temperament Tuning System. Another fellow called Tony Mazzotti released the videos comparing the Precise Temperament Tuning with the current tunings. He, he did a really good job, so you could hear clearly this, the fine differences. Temperament is the name of the process to distributing the errors resulting from the kneading of the spiral of the fifths. In Western music, this simplification took place in the 5th century and has a necessity for keyboard instrument builders due to the technological limitations of the time. Since then, thousands of temperaments have been calculated 
and with the advent of the computers, it has become easier to create and compare them. Robert E. Grant is a Californian polymath with 17 patents, mainly in the field of medical technology and data encryption. He is also a brilliant mathematician who has managed to decipher the millennia mystery of the prime numbers on which world cryptography is based. By positioning integers in 24 positions for every 360 degrees, Crown Sterling solved one of the greatest mathematical mysteries of all time. Academic researchers believe this discovery may be the key to unlocking a new unified physics cosmology, a theory of everything. I see mathematics as a musical and artistic language that is expressed in geometry, where you know, geometry is the sound that we see with our eyes. Robert is also one of the main activists of the number 432, attributing to this number a great mathematical, geometric and cosmological significance. And in July 2020, he released the precise temperament calculated specifically for 432 hertz. And as soon as I heard this, I thought, wow, I must get a piano in this tuning. I must get our piano in this tuning. So I, I contacted Jared and I showed him the precise tuning. And I think to a piano artisan, they are deeply entrenched in equal temperament in 440 hertz. So I'm already pushing the, the absolute limits of what can be done with, with the piano tuning. So I knew this was pushing the friendship. But Jared's very open, he was very keen, and uh, he told me he was able to do it. So he tested the precise tuning with his tuning system on his upright piano, and it was successful. A few weeks later, Jared came around and he did the precise tuning on this piano and it worked an absolute treat. It was, it was amazing. Perfect tuning in the precise temperament. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to present the first concert grand piano in the world tuned to 432 hertz in the precise temperament. Now Simon came over, we did some recordings before in the equal temperament and in the precise temperament. So I'll be posting these on the Facebook 432 Hertz Australia page and you'll see Simon performing there. I'll be posting myself with doing comparisons with the equal temperament and the precise. So for audio files it's a very clear difference. For the average person they're not really hearing it but their body feels it. 432 Hertz is in perfect mathematical balance in our universal geometry with the body. It's in perfect balance. That's why it feels better. So we don't talk about, is 440 hertz better than 432? We're not, we're not talking about that. We're, we're explaining why 432 sounds better. It's because of the mathematics. It's the nature in physics. It's just how it is. So if it can sound better, why not make it sound better? That's what we're about in pro sound will make it sound better. So we had one of Australia's finest pianists come. Lawrence Ong came and recorded a very tricky piece and we'll close tonight with this.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a part of Now Sound 2022. You can follow us on the Facebook page and I'll hand over to Simon. Thank you all so much for coming through. Will you join with me in giving Shannon one last uh, round of applause for all of uh, tonight's presentation? Fantastic. The, uh, the bar, I believe, will be open for a little longer, uh, another, another half an hour or so, something like that. Um, all those uh, drinks that you buy out there continue to support the theatre and uh, the tickets for the raffle uh, support Jackson to be in his softball journey. Thank you all so much for coming through. Uh, drive safely and uh, take care. Thank you very much. <laughs>